Welcome to another podcast from the Antenna Whisperer. That's me, Rudy Wiedemann, K7RAW. And in this podcast, we're going to be talking about antennas under constrained conditions. For example, those of you in HOAs or apartments or even hotels where you're trying to operate and are having a hard time getting an HF antenna set up. This talk is for you. So I want to reassure you all that unless you're underwater in a submarine, almost every other circumstance you're in, you can figure out a way or find a way to get an HF antenna set up and make contacts. And in this case, we might even try something like that, but no, I don't think so. So let's continue on. So some of the challenges you have, of course, are HOAs and deed restrictions, neighbors, you don't want neighbors complaining. You might have limited uh, footprint space. You might not be able to get anything very high off the ground. You might have some challenges mounting something outdoors. It might have to be mounted indoors. Visibility, you don't want to be uh, recognized uh, as being one of those hams out there. Uh, you don't want to have a problem accessing it, setting it up or taking it down, especially if it's a portable operation, you want to make it easy. And of course, you have to consider weather conditions, storms, ice, wind, that sort of thing, uh, as to uh, where it's mounted and uh, how robust it is against the weather. So our goals are to avoid complaints, of course. We don't want to create RFI. We'd like some good radiation efficiency. We want to get hurt. It would be nice to be multiband, at least 20 and 40. You would love to have minimal retuning in band and band to band. That would be very nice. It's not always possible or not always easy or cheap, but uh, it, it can be done in certain circumstances. You want something durable and something easily removable safely. So strategy number one, mobile installations. Let's talk about mobile installations. So here's the ultimate mobile setup. Here's a fellow that's got, I don't know, so many antennas. I can't imagine how he can all fit them on his car. I think this is a gag, but um, unless the XYL is gonna be happy with you doing this, it's probably not something that you can easily do. A more feasible way to go is on an RV or a camper. Here, the fellow's got it mounted to his ladder on his RV. You can either have a fold over style or some kind of a push up telescopic or even a pump up pneumatic telescopic mast for your antenna. Uh, I've seen all of those flavors being used successfully. Screwdriver antennas. Let's talk about screwdrivers and antennas for a moment. Uh, the one on the left is what's called an ATAS. There we go. So this little guy over here is called an ATAS. ATAS 120 from Yezu. And a nice feature is that the Yezu radios, uh, most of the mobile Yezu HF radios, such as the 857, 897, the uh, 891, and the 991, all have the ability to drive this natively from the radio without using a separate power cord because it passes the power through the coax and uses what's called a bias T to inject the DC into the coax and another bias T to extract it out of there and drive the screwdriver up and down. What this is, is a, uh, a little circular ring inside here that slides up and down and touches uh, selectively coils, uh, a uh, taps on the coil up and down. As the motor, as a screwdriver motor, moves that tap up and down, it contacts that coil at different locations, therefore a different amount of coil engaged, different inductance engaged, and you can tune your antenna quite nicely. And it does it automatically, which is really nice. Here on the right, you'll see an example of, I think this is a High Sierra 1500, a full legal mobile uh, type screwdriver antenna. And it, uh, it has a separate connection here for the motor drive and for the RF input to it. 
So that's uh, that's a couple different ways to go on screwdrivers. Ham sticks are another way to go. You may have heard of it. It's about a seven foot long antenna with a lower half with a winding inside for loading and then an adjustable whip on top where you adjust it with a screw right here. And this is over here on the left is a homemade version of something sold by MFJ called a, uh, I think it's an octopus they call it. Anyhow, there are eight ports uh, for threads for the base of the ham sticks, which is a 3 8 by 24 fine thread uh, type of a uh, thread tap. And uh, you put them in in pairs on opposite sides. So you take a pair of 20, 40, uh, maybe 15 and 10. And with this octopus, you can get four bands simultaneously without retuning. And you hook up your coax in right here as your feed point. And you're ready to go. It's a balanced antenna, relatively efficient. You got four bands. It's a, a, a little bit on the uh, uh, footprint uh, side because it's a seven inch in radius or seven foot in radius. 14 feet diameter, but if you can handle it and you want to have four bands at the same time without retuning, it's a pretty viable way to go. People make a lot of contacts around the world with ham sticks. Uh, one of my favorite is a telescopic whip. This happens to be an eight and a half foot, 14 section, collapses down to about 18 inches. And uh, you can see it here on my uh, electric moped going mobile QRP with my uh, Shegu 6100 10 watt uh, transceiver here on using the uh, moped itself as the counterpoise, as a, the ground plane counterpoise uh, to the whip that you can see the lower part of it right here. And that's actually quite successful. I've made a lot of uh, contacts, including DX contacts with this setup. And uh, it's, uh, it's very convenient. I wouldn't necessarily go uh, true mobile, be operating while, while moving, because uh, my uh, hands are a little bit busy driving. But I can pull over, pull up the whip, tune up, and be on the air in a matter of moments. So let's talk temporary and portable operation. So here is an interesting setup. This is my friend Robert and 7 get and he's got one of those vertical telescopic whips, but he's got 24 10 foot radials of special silicone wire that lays down like, like wet spaghetti. It's really wonderful stuff. And uh, he hooks it up to a little tripod base here with a common mode choke and a couple of uh, uh, sacks down here, sandbags, to hold the uh, base of the tripod down. And he gets great results. He uh, gets contacts all over the world with this thing, and uh, it works quite well. Now, let's talk for a second about telescopic mass. This guy over here is what's called a doka pole. I like that, I have two of them myself. Uh, these are cam lever operated. They're totally adjustable cams. And uh, you have the top as a standard painter pole type thread, which is a three quarter by five turn per inch thread in case anybody wants an adapter or a tap for it. Uh, that's what you'd be looking to use to be able to adapt straight away to this thing. Uh, but it goes up fast. It's aluminum sections and they have them from like 12 foot up to 31, 32 feet in uh, total height, I think. So those are really very, very convenient. And they're quite stiff, quite strong. This is a uh, this is a telescopic mast from Harbor Freight, all fiberglass, or I don't know, maybe it's PVC. And uh, relatively inexpensive, but you probably need to use some kind of ring clamps, uh, hose clamps to uh, keep the sections from collapsing down upon each other. But uh, given that, it's a good way to go. Now, I want to mention about mass. There's a myth out there that says that you have to have a non-conducting mast. Well, it's not true. This is uh, a mast with multiple aluminum sections that are not electrically conducting to each other. They have a coating on the outside called uh, anodization, which protects the aluminum from corroding. It's all it does. It's weatherproofing it. 
but it's not in uh, not conductive. So those sections are not talking to each other, not conducting to each other, and it's not conducted to the ground. So it's a floating metal. So it really doesn't interfere, especially if you've got most of the antenna on top or above that section. Um, you won't even know that it's there. And on parts where you have, let's say, a counterpoise hanging down, I haven't found much of an effect with this kind of a pole. Now, a particularly useful thing on the right is what's called a flagpole buddy. This is a little base mount that you mount, say, onto the side of your RV or your house or whatever, onto the wall, and it provides a cup for the base of your mast. And this guy right here also mounts to the wall somewhere above it, several feet above it. What you do is you take your mast and you put it in in a slightly angled way so that it can fit inside this opening and then you straighten it out so that now it's straight up and down and then drop the bottom of it into the cup and you have a very secure rotatable antenna for either a rotatable dipole <clears throat> and i've even seen people use hex beams uh, in this fashion quite successfully so it's a it's a very uh, neat way to go and uh, something you might want to check out. Another popular antenna for portable operations is the buddy pole and its partner, the buddy stick. The buddy pole is a uh, horizontal balanced loaded uh, set of whips or pair of whips uh, on an adjustable uh, connector that can be changed to a horizontal or a V shape. Uh, this one is a buddy stick. It's for a single whip with a loading coil here in the middle, center loaded. And it's weighed down by this weight to keep the tripod down on the ground. Here, this guy's using uh, guy wires. These are simply guy wires. They are not radials. So that's another way to go. I've never had a lot of great success with the buddy stick or buddy pole. Some people swear by them, but um, I... I've never been a big fan of them. They're they kind of touchy in terms of setting the right tap points. And of course, you have to do it to both of them the same way on either side on the buddy pole. So, But it's something to think about. And if you can play with one, I encourage you to try it out. Now, here's an interesting setup. Uh, this is a vertical tilt-up. This fellow's got a, uh, a little uh, uh, common mode choke here. And he's able to tilt this up and set pins in, drop pins in right here to hold this thing, snap it in right to these notches. And it holds the antenna very securely to a stake that's been uh, pounded into the ground. And I think it's even got some concrete under these leaves here. So that's a great way to be stealthy. And um, I wouldn't say it's portable, but it is definitely stealthy. Another way to go is a banister mount. This one's from MFJ. I think this is either a 40 or an 80 meter loading coil at the base. And you can clamp this down right here to your banister. And uh, it's got a counterpoise. That's what this is here. And uh, the uh, uh, you get your feed line. And it's not bad. It uses a whip antenna. And uh, some people are actually able to operate out of their hotel with this. Uh, they've actually made successful contacts as long as they don't have too much in the way of buildings right next to them. They have some clear space off of their balcony, then uh, they can make contacts with this. That's uh, pretty interesting. But it will need some adjustment and tuning on this coil to get you in resonance. Now, let's talk for a second about magnetic loops. This one's from MFJ. And this guy here is a controller. Now, magnetic loops can work quite well, but they have a very high Q. In other words, they have a narrow bandwidth. They are very sharp tuning, so uh, quite sensitive sometimes. So you, you have to be willing to be retuning this thing if you're going to be changing frequencies. Now, if you're working POTA and you camp out on a frequency and it's clear and you're just working that frequency, this could be a great solution. It's relatively portable. I think this thing's like three, four foot in diameter. And uh, they're not cheap. They're several hundred dollars to over $700. 
um, uh, for the ones that have an automatic tuner in it, which is kind of nice. And I know a friend who has one, and he has great DX and great luck with uh, making lots of contacts with a magnetic loop antenna. Something you can remember about mag loops is that the maximum strength is in the direction of the the coil or the loop of the antenna. So in other words, the maximum strength is in this direction, not in and out of the page, uh, not through the loop. That's the weakest, that's the null. The strongest signal received and transmitted is gonna be in the plane of the coil. Some people wanna make it omnidirectional. They'll lay this down horizontally with a horizontal loop, but uh, some people have noisy interfering things next door or nearby, and they want to null it out, they just point the the perpendicular part of this loop towards that direction, and they can uh, really suppress that local noise. So that's mag loops. Now, you may have heard about slinky antennas. I actually have a lot of experience with slinky antennas. I've built slinky dipoles, slinky rotatable dipoles, of 10, 15, 20 meters, 40 meters even. The, uh, they're great in a pinch. Uh, if you've got really restricted space and you want to put it up and you want to take it down in a matter of moments, you can use some uh, fishing line here, some like a uh, higher test, like a 100 or 200 uh, type uh, rated, pound rated fishing line um, and uh, hold it up with that and then stretch it out and uh, you can tune it up. The problem with slinky dipoles is what makes it slinky like a spring is the fact that it's spring metal, spring steel. And spring steel does not have a good conductivity. So you're gonna have a lot of ohmic losses with this. It's not gonna be very efficient, but in a pinch, it'll get out. And it could be a great emergency antenna because you can almost put this in your pocket. This fellow's got two of them. He's running it as a dipole, as you can see, one here and one this side. And uh, this looks like in a 40 meter configuration. And uh, you can tune it by stretching it or releasing it. That's how you tune this guy. And so, uh, that's a pretty interesting solution. Now, let's talk about what's called Petlowani spirals. Now, there's a fellow by the name of Petlowani who did a lot of experimentation and work on it. Uh, and a company called Tactena actually sells these as kits. Now, they are kind of finicky to tune. And you can get them on 80 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters. They're typically single banders. This uh, diameter here is maybe two and a half, three feet, and the boom length might be around four feet or so. So you can work this off the back porch somewhere, and people actually have in apartments. They've worked it off of a back porch, and uh, if they're willing to take the time to tune it up properly, uh, it can work reasonably well. So that's, a, that's kind of an interesting antenna. Now, here's an example of my friend Robert again, but he, this time he's putting his tripod on window screen, aluminum window screen. Trust me, the nylon window screen doesn't work so well as a ground, but the aluminum window screen, which is easily uh, purchased at your local hardware store, this patch is like uh, four feet wide and about six feet long. It's all you need, just roll it up, uh, unroll it, lay it down, put your uh, tripod on it, hook it up to your tripod, to the base, of your antenna and uh, you're off and running. So that's a pretty cool solution for some of you who wanna work out in the field or uh, work someplace uh, constrained, as long as you've got enough height for the whip. This one's up at 18 and a half feet. He's running 20 meters with this. So now let's move on to the concealment strategy. Here, this fellow's using a fan dipole uh, three bands separated by one, two, three spaces here, uh, up in his antenna and putting in a uh, inline common mode choke, which is always a very good idea, sometimes known as a one-to-one -one ballon, but I don't like to say ballon because it confuses people. So it's, it's a common mode choke is what it is. And uh, while you can't rotate it, so it's gonna have a preferred uh, stronger signal in this direction than in this direction, uh, people have made contacts with this. 
It's not advisable if you have a metal roof, I can assure you that. But if you have a roof that's not metallic and it's up high, and it's the highest thing you can get, and it's, there's nothing else you can do, uh, people have made contacts this way. It isn't the best solution, but it is workable. Uh, some people have actually used their mobile antennas and mobile whips inside a garage, except I wouldn't recommend it if you've got a metallic garage door or metal garage frame. But uh, for those people with all wood, uh, I know people have made contacts through their garage uh, out to the rest of the world. Uh, a little bit of a, a tough situation. They're not going to get the best performance but uh, it's doable, especially in UHF, VHF. It's quite doable, uh, again, if you don't have any metal nearby. This guy is a what's called a go-to antenna. It's got a, an interesting anon here, and you can see he's dragging a counterpoise on the ground. Uh, actually, I take that back. This is the counterpoise here. You can barely see it going off into the distance. Uh, this guy here, the fat thing, is his feed line. And he's got a stake in the ground and a counterpoise and a telescopic whip. So this guy, actually, you can drop the whip and be almost invisible. You could actually put this, hide this in a bush if you wanted to, and uh, then pull up the telescopic whip when you wanted to use it. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting strategy. And I know some people get pretty good results with this antenna. Now, camouflage. We can do the old standby trick of the American flag. Typically, this is going to be an off-center fed vertical dipole, about 23, 24 foot overall length. The feed point is down here inside. It's all inside, usually PVC, right around 20% from the end, 20% of the full length. And uh, then very often they'll bring a ladder line down inside because it's a high impedance here. You're going to be around 400 ohms. So ladder line would match it pretty well. 450 ohm ladder line would match it fairly well without balance or anything. And they would bring it down to a common mode choke and a tuner in the ground. And I have a friend who does a lot of BDX this way, and he's quite happy with it. So if you can afford to do that, uh, this is a pretty decent way to go. Now, rain gutters, believe it or not, can be actually used. You can load up a rain gutter. Obviously, you want to control the length and have it isolated and insulated from any other metal around there. But you can actually load up a rain gutter. It actually has a reasonably good bandwidth because of the surface area you've got on the rain gutter. So again, don't use plastic rain gutters. They don't load up well at all. But aluminum rain gutters are fine. Uh, galvanized metal, uh, galvanized steel even. So uh, that's a possibility. And fence tops. You can actually run wire off the top of a fence top and get quite a length of wire, either for a receive antenna or for a long wire, an end fed half wave or something like that. Now, I'd caution you to not expect too much because you can get a lot of interference from your neighbor's uh, metal. For example, the side of this house inside underneath this stucco is all chicken wire, screen mesh that's grounded. So you're going to get uh, a lot of uh, blocking of your RF in this direction. So just something to be aware of because of the, the height constraint that you're dealing with here along the, the fence tops. But it is pretty good at concealment. Uh, I actually know one person who actually built a uh, birdhouse. He put his loading coil in here, and he had the rest of the pole as his actual antenna with an insulator on the bottom. And he was running, I think, 10 meters with this and uh, ran the coax up inside the pole. Uh, and it was a, uh, I think it was like a fiberglass pole, and then ran the, um, the actual antenna line down from there to the ground. So... There's some pretty clever things that you can do. Uh, tall trees. This is wonderful. If you've got nice tall trees, you can maybe possibly string up an antenna that you can drop with a pulley up on the tree. You just drop the, the line and when you want to operate it. You can have your feed line uh, or your antenna come up like this, have it, your feed line dropping down here. 
uh, and possibly even extend it over to the neighboring trees and make an inverted L or an N-fed half wave or something along those lines. So uh, that's very nice because you're getting your antenna high up in the air and the higher the better. Now I wanted to point this out that some people are using fake rocks to hide their antenna tuners. It's a great way to hide your antenna tuner so that uh, nobody would have any idea that you've got any electronics out there in the garden. You'd probably want to bury your uh, coax from your rig, from the shack, uh, in PVC underground to get it to the rock. And then uh, put the rock right next to the base of your antenna and nobody will be the wiser. Trellises and awnings are uh, pretty cool to uh, hide your antenna. I know people who have built small dipoles right into the top of their trellis or around the edges of their awning, and we're able to use that. As long as you don't have a lot of metal around it, as long as it's all wood, uh, it actually can be done. Same thing with canopies, okay, and uh, uh, either permanent sunroofs or portable canopies. You can do sort of the same thing. You don't have a lot of uh, length here, uh, especially on the portable canopies that you might on a uh, sun deck, uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully this will give you some ideas. Bird repellers. This is a great way to use a some wire because you can run a long wire or an end fed half wave, an off center fed dipole, a number of wires around in different directions uh, and use it and call it a bird repeller. And who's who are they to say that it's not, right? Except when they see that this is uh, metal or plastic or an insulator and not metal going down to the ground. So um, <clears throat> the, uh, but they won't know that. Now here's one of my favorite, is a slot antenna. This fella actually put a slot into a recycled DISH TV antenna, a DISH. Okay, he's not using it for the DISH TV, but he put this slot in here, which is exactly for VHF frequencies around 146 megahertz. Reasonable bandwidth too. Now what's interesting on slot antennas is you feed it near the end across the slot okay at the right point to get the right impedance match and the polarization is actually vertical it's perpendicular to the slot itself the main portion of the slot uh, which is really counterintuitive but it actually works i know a friend who actually uses this uh, at his house and so uh, again nobody's the wiser about even noticing the slot if they even notice it at all and the uh, the LMR 400, which is 400,000 thick as opposed to 240,000 thick, is even lower loss. If you're running long lines, I'd, ex, uh, I'd re recommend that you go with LMR 240 or 400. Uh, remember to deploy your ground or your counterpoise wisely. Make sure that it balances out. One way to tell, by the way, is if your radiating element is at the theoretical quarter wavelength, and it's not in tune, you have to either stretch it or shorten it. That tells you that your ground or counterpoise is not uh, as effective as it's going to be, and you've got an out of balance antenna situation. Uh, once you've got your quarter wave uh, whip uh, at quarter wave length and you get everything dialed in, then you know your ground or counterpoise is working well. Of course, you want to stay clear of blocking material like metal, buildings, uh, mountains, that sort of thing. Of course, stay away from power lines. That's always a very, very wise move. Uh, I always recommend you use a common mode choke at the antenna end in most cases, unless you're doing an end fed or you're deliberately trying to use the shield of the coax as a counterpoise. I always put a common mode choke where the coax meets the antenna to isolate the coax from becoming part of your antenna radiating system and preventing RF in a shock. It's a very, very simple solution, and it helps getting you balanced in your antenna tune-up enormously. Now, if you do need an ATU, uh, it's always best to put it at the feed point if possible, uh, right there at the base of your antenna, for example, under one of those fake rocks. And finally, 
a better antenna is actually worth about five times that of a power amplifier in terms of money spent. So your money goes five times further by putting it into an antenna as opposed to putting it into a power amplifier. And then, by the way, the power amplifier won't help your receive side either, but a better antenna usually does. So takeaways, there's really only three issues to solve here. One is the physical or technical limitations. Uh, another is the visibility by nosy neighbors. And third, the adherence to the rules and regulations. So those are the only real uh, constraints or gotchas we're trying to solve. But almost any location can be used to operate HF. And as you can see, there was a huge variety of approaches and equipment. I'm sure you can find or see others that I haven't touched upon. Uh, but uh, you need to stay stealthy, flexible, and reasonably accommodating. Uh, a little bit of planning, creativity, and equipment can solve most problems. Expect to be limited on certain bands at certain times. Uh, you just have to accept that fact. And then finally, it's often easier to beg forgiveness than to gain permission in some of these situations. As long as you don't get egregious and push the envelope too hard, uh, as long as you're uh, pretty accommodating, you try not to be too obvious, too unsightly, most of the time you can get away with it. So with that, um, I hope you... Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope it gave you some good ideas on what you can do with antennas when you are constrained in space. So with that, thanks again. This is Rudy Weinman, K7RAW, saying 73, and have a great day. Bye-bye.